All right, good afternoon and welcome. We're so excited to have you join us for this next installment on our discussions of race and racism. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner and I have the privilege of being the Dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. And today, instead of being one of the panelists, I'm gonna serve as the moderator. My pronouns are she and hers. And as I always like to do at the start of any presentation, I want to start by acknowledging that we here at the University of Utah acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So we are, of course, here to engage in this important community outreach activity to discuss what is critical race theory. You've certainly heard a lot about it in the news lately. Um, it's been a hot topic, but what you may not know is that critical race theory has been around for decades. And so I'm really excited that we have two excellent panelists who are going to talk about what is critical race theory and what does it mean to today, both in terms of K through 12 education and in terms of higher education. So first, it's my pleasure, our first speaker is going to be Cecilia Espinoza, and she is a graduate of SJ Quinney College of Law, and she has had an amazing career in the law, but for our purposes, um, I'm really excited that she can join us today because she was a mentee of Richard Delgado, who was one of the co-authors of the original Critical Race Theory book, um, and she also extensively taught it in her own career and contributed in very important ways. So she's going to start off the panel today by explaining what critical race theory is, what its origins were, and kind of the development of the theory. Then I'm excited to have my colleague, Dean Martell Teasley, follow her with a discussion of how critical race theory has really manifest itself in, man in modern times and how these discussions are impacting K through 12 education and higher education. And I should mention that Dean Teasley is Dean of our College of Social Work here at the University of Utah. So again, I'm very excited to have our two panelists today. Um, after they are done presenting, I will be moderating our questions. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat function um, or excuse me, actually, no, it's going to be, um, you can submit your questions through the YouTube streaming and those will be sent to us to be asked. My apologies. I forgot that this was streaming. Um, so with that, uh, we will be excited for your questions. Both Cecilia and Martel are gonna speak for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we will open it up to questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cecilia Espinoza. Thank you, Dean. Um, I really appreciate that introduction and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. As you said, my job today is to provide the history and background of critical race theory and I'm really excited to do that. And at the outset, let me say that it's important to note that critical race theory is the name and not critical of race theory. This isn't about criticizing certain races. I'm gonna start with stories because that's fundamental to the critical race theory movement. And I think it's important to talk about that. So when I entered the legal academy in 1990 as a law professor, I was part of a large class of minority professors. In fact, with my class, the Latino, Latina professors reached 51 in total. Just as we had broken the glass ceiling by entering and completing law school, we were also among the first professors of color on our respective campuses. In my own case, the hiring was the result of pressure placed on the academy by the Hispanic National Bar Association. A couple of years earlier, as a member of the board of the HNBA, I had moved a resolution created by Michael Olivas, a prominent law professor, to create a dirty dozen list. The list named the law schools with the highest percentage of Latina and Latino law students and, na, and no Latina or Latino faculty. The law schools responded by interviewing and giving offers to Latino and Latina candidates. I negotiated with, an, with another Latino. We were both given offers at the University of Denver and at two different law schools in Houston. We decided that being together would help both of us. 
DU was surprised because they thought that neither of us would accept the offer and they could tell the community that they had tried. In the end, we were pitted against each other and only one of us was offered tenure. However, during the tenure process, I was invited to the first LAT CRIC conference. At that meeting, my purpose and role in the academy became clear. Discussions with others, especially a strong contingent from St. Mary's in San Antonio, affirmed the concepts of intersectionality, race, and the existence of a black-white paradigm. The conference introduced me to other scholars of color who openly discussed being outsiders. My own passion and perspectives were validated and I saw how my belief in social justice could be married with my writing in the academy. I was subsequently mentored by Richard Delgado, who was a tenured professor at the University of Colorado. Through that relationship, my own, my own understanding of the new critical race, lack crit perspectives were developed. I embraced intersectionality and interdisciplinary work, teaching and writing about crime and immigration, and writing about the unintended consequences of the Violence Against Women's Act on immigrant women. In Richard's first book, the first edition of the, of the book, the theory of critical race is laid out by sharing the writing of critical race scholars and debates between Richard's professor persona and a student of European descent named Rodrigo. While the newest edition of the book provides a primer on the movement and its place in society today, those early writings have stood the test of time and continue to demonstrate the foundations upon which critical race theory was developed. So I urge you to look it up and read some of those wonderful uh, articles. Going back and, and according to Delgado in the book, there are three main principles of crit race theory. First, that racism is ordinary, not aberrational and embedded within system, systems and institutions. Second, that racism that our second, that our system of white over color ascendancy serves important purposes. And third, that the race is not biologically real, but is a product of social thought that can and has changed over time. Finally, from these principles, scholars, primar primarily scholars of color, inserted and embraced lived experiences and storytelling as legitimate expressions of legal thought. Some of the powerful examples of the narrative writings came from the women scholars I knew who wrote about how they wore their hair and the impact or statement within various communities that that led to. In a nod to the writings of Margaret Montoya and Paulette Caldwell, I curled my hair into ringlets today to tie myself to my history and recollections about the process my mother used to create ringlets when I was a child. Born in the legal academy, the critical race theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It, is not, it not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. It sets out not only to ascertain how society organizes itself among, along racial lines and hierarchies, but to transform it for the better. Critical race theory builds on the insights of two previous movements, critical legal studies and radical feminism, to both of which it owes a large debt. Critical race theory also acknowledges legal realism, which, is, which was an early 20th century forerunner of critical legal studies that disavowed mechanical jurisprudence in favor of social science, politics, and policy judgment. It also draws from certain European philosophers and theorists, such as Antonia Gramsci, Jacques Derrida, and as well from American radical tradition exemplified by such figures as Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, W.E. Du Bois, Cesar Chavez, and Martin Luther King Jr. And the Black Power Movement and Chicano movements of the, of the 60s and early 70s. In turning back to the principles, let's talk about those. First, that racism is ordinary, not aberrational. It is a normal science. 
the usual way society does business, the common everyday experience of most people of color in this country. This tenant focuses on the structural presence of racism, not racists, and validates the experience of others as they experience, as they experience racism, racism in their daily lives. The second feature that our system of white over color ascendancy serves an important purpose that serves important purposes is sometimes called interest convergence or material determinism. Because racism advances the interests of both white elites materially and working class people psychically, large segments of society have little incentive to eradicate it. Consider, for example, Derek Bell's shocking proposal that Brown versus Board of Education, considered a great triumph of civil rights litigation, may have resulted more from the self-interest of elite whites than the desire to help blacks. In fact, his theory that the Justice Department and State Department intervened, the Justice Department intervened in the case due to international pressure placed on the Justice Department and State Department was established 10 years later by historian Mary Duzdiak. Thus, colorblind or formal conceptions of equality expressed in rules that insist only on treatment that is the same across the board can thus remedy only the most blatant forms of discrimination, such as mortgage redlining or the refusal to hire a black PhD rather than a white high school dropout. Um, a third theme of critical race theory, social construction, the social construction thesis holds that race and races are products of social thought and relations, not objective, inherent, or fixed. They correspond to no biological or genetic reality. Rather, races are categories that society invents, manipulates, or retires when convenient. Thus, various ways of immigrants now considered white, Irish, Italian, and Southern Europeans were once considered black for purposes of limiting immigration into the United States. Crits are also highly suspicious of another liberal mainstay, namely rights. Particularly some of the older, more radical critical race theorists, scholars with roots in racial realism and, and, economic, and an economic view of history. They believe that moral and legal rights are apt to do the right holder much less good than many would like to think. Rights are almost always procedural, for example, to a fair process, rather than substantive, for example, to food, housing, education, or tenure. In my own experience, I remember well the statement of, one, of a white male, tenured male colleague who said, minority rights, but majority rules. This was a clear example that I would be given a process toward tenure, but the majority ever capable of moving the goalposts would determine whether meeting the standards and procedures would be sufficient. Think how our system applauds affording everyone equality of opportunity, but resists programs that assure equality of results. Moreover, rights are almost always cut back when they conflict with the interests of the powerful. Many crits believe rights are alienating. They separate people from each other. Stay away, I've got my rights, rather than encouraging them to form close, respectful communities. And with civil rights, lower courts have found it easy to narrow or distinguish the broad ringing landmark decision like Brown versus Board of Education, voting rights legislation, or Roe versus Wade. The group whom they supposedly benefit always greets the cases and statutes with great celebration. But after the celebration dies down, the great victory is quietly cut back by narrow interpretation, administrative obstruction, or delay. In the end, the minority group is left little better than it was before, if not worse. Its friends, the liberals, believing the problem has been solved, go on to something else, while its adversaries, the conservatives, Furious that the Supreme Court or Congress has given away once again to the undeserving minorities, step up their resistance. Some critical race theorists, accordingly, have stopped focusing on liberalism and its ills and begun to address the conservative tide. 
and a determined group of idealists maintain that rights are not a snare and a delusion. Rather, they can bring genuine gains while the struggle to obtain them unifies the group. The power of critical race theory is that it has galvanized a new approach to the issues it has tackled. In closing, I quote Angela Harris's foreword from the most recent edition of, his, of Delgado's book. Critical race theory not only dares to treat race as central to the law and policy of the United States, it dares to look beyond the popular belief that getting rid of racism means simply getting rid of ignorance or encourage every, encouraging everyone to get along. To read this primer is to be sobered by the recognition that racism is a part of the structure of legal institutions, but also to be invigorated by the creativity, power, wit, and humanity of the voices speaking about ways to change that structure. As race, race relations continue to shape our lives in the new century, setting the stage for new tragedies and new hope, critical race theory has become an indispensable tool for making sense of it all. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, and I'll take over from here. Uh, good to be with all of you today, and thank you for those insights there. I'll pick up and talk a little bit more about some of the basic tenets and why uh, critical race theory is extremely relevant today, as well as, uh, as Dr. Cron Warner talked about how it's impacting K through 12 education and why it's such a conversation in higher education right now. And one of the things I wanna talk about uh, initially here is that uh, part of why uh, critical race theory is such a conversation is that the demography of within America is changing quite exponentially, uh, where we will be a quote unquote minority majority country shortly uh, as some uh, demographic uh, estimations uh, project. Now that has caused quite a stir. Uh, so in our normative uh, ethnic and racial groups, there has, while there's always been intermarriage, it has exploded in recent times. We have uh, lots of, uh, we have Asian Americans marrying uh, Anglo-Americans, whites, Amer uh, Blacks and whites, as well as Latinx folks marrying people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. And so that prompts different questions about children and how they're socialized. And we saw a uh, dynamic discussion about the census and then different classifications of people. That is also to say that we often talk about a colorblind society. And so one of the tenets of critical race theory is that there really is not a colorblind society, that we're a racialized society. And as uh, the former speaker said, race is very normative and very ordinary. If you think about it, we all are very, we all socialize to race. And so when we talk about school children, uh, probably about age three or four, children start to realize that they belong to particular racial and ethnic groups for messages sent to them within the homes, within pictures, within media, and several other things, and several other places. And in our society, we have people, a way of making people uh, pick and choose who they are based on racialization and socialization process. And so then about uh, particularly when children turn adolescents, they really have an identity formation of who they are and what group they belong to and what it means to be part of that group. So when we see uh, marriage because, across racial and ethnic lines, then there is a question of which group do I belong to? What is my identity? How should I be socialized? And what does it mean to be a person of a multicultural background? And so that has prompted a lot of discussions. Now, media claims have taken it and done several things with it and basically used many of the binary positions between blacks and whites, which is a critical uh, issue that we have not solved within our country uh, that really came from the one drop rule. And so we use these very polarized positions to say that this is a denigration of whites or a denigration of another racial group. And that's not true. But I will also say as a caveat, there's some silliness to any type of theory that people use. And there are probably people who would use critical race theory in problematic ways, just as the, uh, people do with any other theory, theoretical understanding. Now, when we talk about being critical, we're really talking about an intense interrogation of the subject matter. That is not criticism of our Anglo-American or white brothers and sisters, but an interrogation 
of what it means to be white, what it means to hold a power structure based on whiteness, and what it means to be people of different uh, ethnic and racial persuasions. That has also prompted many offshoots of critical race theory. And so now we have what's called the crit in terms of our Latinx populations, and they have different questions that they asked about race and ethnicity. And so the whole challenge of immigration, the whole challenge of Latinx women, there was a big uh, articles, there were some articles recently uh, that discuss the uh, sterilization of black women as well as African-American women within the California prison systems, which happened within the 60s and 70s. And that's just really coming to fruition through several lawsuits. And then the whole issue of immigration, uh, where we, in many ways of racial common sense thinking, think of our Latinx brothers and sisters as some form of immigrants from somewhere or another, uh, when in general, America is full of people who have immigrated from different areas, but we seem to place that tag on particular groups. Our Asian American brothers and sisters have other challenges. And so there's critical Asian theory where they're looking at the challenge of what is called a mo uh, model minority. Uh, they don't really live up to that. The whole notion of Asians as passive and as foreigners and then lumping them all together. Uh, that is the Chinese with the uh, Koreans as well as Japanese. And so there's a critical discussion about that. And our Native American brothers and sisters have had critical engagement about land sovereignty, as well as moving away from the consistent black white paradigm that we have in this country that has uh, was part of the buttress of the start of critical race theory in the first place. And so there's questions about family structure and how that works out in terms of people from different racial and ethnic groups. Uh, and then in terms of re residential segregation, as the former speaker talked about, uh, identification, and then how we look at families based on different uh, color formations and different racial and ethnic identities in terms of who they are. And I wanna say that that is really important, just mentioning one thing in particular, that when people uh, come from the continent of Africa, um, we know that uh, African-Americans, for one, have the highest infant mortality rate within the country. And when we separate everything out in the research, we find that there's lots of stress in terms of being an American that causes that infant mortality. And so what we're finding is that African women who come from the African continent, where they don't have uh, who they are based on skin color, but an affiliation based on tribal and ethnic groups, they are meant to pick and choose which racial group they belong to. And what research is showing is over time that African women from the African continent, their infant mortality rates are starting to mimic those that African-Americans have here in America. And that is because the stress and the racial polarization. And then we have uh, folks, our brothers and sisters in public health who are interested in critical race theory and looking at the challenges there in terms of the medical challenges that people have from stress and cardiovascular disease based on racism. And so there's a ton of questions being asked there in terms of what does race mean in terms of health and public health. And so you can see the wide variety, uh, and I'm just touching the surface here, of questions being discussed both inside in academia, but in academia in more formal ways to get at questions about how we live, where we're gonna live and how we treat each other as humans based on a critical race perspective. Um, and there is the whole notion of whiteness and whiteness studies itself, because whites, the whole category of whites is that of a set aside category of people. And then there's this thing that we lump everyone in called people of color, which is a term that I really don't like because it separates whites out from other people. And we won't end the challenge of racism or having to discuss critical race theory until we solve the challenge of whiteness. As Jane Baldwin has said, as long as you're white, I'm black. In other words, as long as you wanna play this game, I'll play it too. And so until America decides to uh, move away from this, then we'll continue to have this discussion and we've made race, as the former speaker said, 
an everyday ordinary part of who we are as people. I'll stop right there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that excellent discussion. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of questions that we had submitted ahead of time from our audience members. So thank you so much for those questions. Um, so the first question is, why is critical race theory so controversial? I think for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, most folks don't know what it is. And so when our former president starts um, really uh, referring to African countries as, uh, excuse my language, shithole countries. He is basically engaging in critical race theory because he's talking about a racial and ethnic group in doing so in a wrong-headed way. And then when he demonizes our Latinx brothers and sisters as drug runners coming across the border, he's actually engaging in critical race theory then. So he brings up the topic. But if I could share my screen for a minute, I hope I can. I want to show you one graph, which I think is really uh, instrumental in all this. And this here looks at productivity within our country. And if you see from 1948 to the mid, uh, uh, mid 1970s, we saw that productivity and hourly compensa compensations to wage workers went kind of neck and neck. And then we saw in the 1970s, and particularly accelerating in the 1980s with the Reagan administration, an acceleration of globalization, which took jobs out of our country. We see productivity goes up exponentially and continues to accelerate. But look at hourly wages and compensation. And we see huge dips and losses amongst the middle class within our society. That has caused a lot of trepidation. And it's very easy to convert back to tribalism and racial, um, um, racial harangue in terms of that. And that is exactly what has been happen happening. When in general, we all should be very concerned about the lack of distribution of wealth going to the middle class and opportunities for low income folks. And so politicians knowing very well what they're doing have stroke racial fears and use critical race theory as a wedge issue to not talk about the real challenges that we have. And I, I would agree that I think a lot of people do not know at all what critical race theory is about. I mean, as I gave the overview and from an academic perspective, the theory itself is about putting into place in the legal structure and different analysis that could result in structural change. And in response to that, I think especially the conservatives, misquote some of the principles of critical race theory and are really reacting more to the issue of multiculturalism than critical race theory itself. And from my perspective, and we see this in the education system especially, it's multiculturalism and the ability to teach that there is the intersection that the Dean talked about of races and dynamics and the change that's happening that is coalescing with the change in society that today we, we not only have this theory which was looking at, at its outset in the black white paradigm. And those of us in the lack crit and Asian crit and this crit and, and uh, Native American critical subgroups that were partners with, with the, uh, the lack crit, the critical race initial statement really challenged our own uh, communities of color because we said, look, it can't, the world in the, in the United States is not simply the black white paradigm. And by introducing the other critical race notions, we believed we would actually start to change the racial discussion that was happening in the country. That when our African-American brothers and sisters were only advancing a critical race theory that was on a black white paradigm, we were already buying into the white paradigm of structural power that's, that based everything in this country on slavery and its adverse impact. And by increasing the sociological uh, realities of our community, we have necessarily changed the discussion because it's not anymore just keeping down the African-Americans to a structural system. It's the fear of the majority community losing its status as society changes. And we have, um, as, as we are seeing in California already, a majority minority state 
And as projected in the census, we'll see that around the country. And it's that notion that's embedded in the, in the communities that have held power traditionally that how do we maintain power if we're no longer the majority? And so I think that part of what's happening in terms of latching onto critical race theory as a negative um, situation is a way to hold on to the power that has historically existed by otherizing, if you will, the critical race movement. And whenever you can put something up as the boogeyman you can knock down, you avoid what you're actually doing, which is maintaining the power at its core. And that's the purpose of critical race theory in its, itself too, is to look at those very, um, we used to call them in law, in law school, straw men, right? We put up a straw man in order to avoid really looking at what we're trying to do. And I think that's what's happening in terms of some of the backlash against critical race theory is it has become the straw man to avoid looking at how do we navigate in a society, as Dean points out, that is multicultural, that is multiracial, and that we see even from the election of President Obama, the, at the initial outset, did the African-American community dare to embrace him as an African-American because of his multiracial identity? I mean, so there were, we're seeing all of those things come together at the same time. And the fact that we've had a 40 year history that has developed a successful new dialogue then makes that the boogeyman and the straw man that we have to attack. Great. So our next question asks, um, as adults, we spend most of our time either with family or at work. How would you address critical race theory in the work environment? My field has been pressured to increase race relations trainings. I have observed my colleagues push back on those trainings. I'm seeking any advice you have to offer. Well, that's a tough one. Uh, I would think, um, you know, there's an African proverb of how long it takes to eat a whole elephant. And it's one bite at a time. It takes quite a while. And I really would start with baby steps uh, and trying to get at the misunderstandings and talking to people about uh, what's healthy in terms of certain such discourse. So I was at a university in Southern California a couple of years back, and I was invited to engage in a, a diversity discussion about race. And uh, just about everyone from disciplines across campus was there. Uh, but the provost said that the engineers um, did not want to come there because they saw no reason to discuss diversity and inclusion in engineering. And I asked him, uh, what was the makeup of the engineering department or uh, college at that time? And he said, predominantly white. So he basically answered it himself. Uh, so people don't know why in many ways. And it is these small discussions. Uh, and, and let's be clear, you have what I may just say, excuse me, some very obtuse thinking by people, uh, but you have to get past that uh, in terms of the type of work uh, that's needed because think about, just think about, and one example I'll use as if someone told me I was not part of the Teasleys all of a sudden, and there was something really profoundly wrong with that. And I found out that my DNA strand came from some other group. That would profoundly shatter lots of the ways that I think in, in my identity about who I am as a person. And so when we say to racial and ethnic groups that uh, your group is dominating another group, it controls most of the power and it needs to succeed some of that power to other groups for greater harmony. That's really pulling at people's identity about who they are. And that starts with the socialization in the K through 12 process and it extends into higher education. I would surmise that both myself as well as Cecilia, as probably many people on here, probably got very little about diversity, equity, and inclusion in K-12. And I got very little in a college education. I have 300 cre college credit hours uh, on my uh, transcripts. You wouldn't know, thought I knew anything but other than about Greek and Roman civilization uh, if you look at those transcripts. And, and I would agree with that. Um, I think that Growing up in Utah, I, I always tell this, and I don't, I don't know if I, I kind of am, this is a risky statement, but I always say I succeeded, and, and, but I first encountered my glass ceiling at the law school, because I was in the first class of 
women. There were, I was the second Latina to be admitted to law school in the state of Utah. We were the first large class of, of students of color. There were nine of us in our class which is not very many. And so being in that forerunner situation where I was always breaking the glass ceiling, it was, I didn't really even know about race growing up in Utah, which is another kind of an issue because I, I just didn't experience it. Um, and, and, and part of that was because I had been in private school before I transferred to the public school setting. And so I was academically one of those people that always got pulled out to do the sample tests. They would use me because I would be a double count. I would do really well on the test and I was a minority. So that would raise the inflate the grade and, and success rate for this for this for the school school district. And I never realized that. But when I got to law school, it was the first time someone said to me, I had to take minority classes. I had to be part of the student achievement program. And if I didn't do that, then I would, when I failed out of law school, don't come to anybody for help. And it was the first time that someone had ever identified my intellectual capacity with my race. And so I think that happens to a lot of people in the workplace or into other places where you have obtained things on your merit. And then all of a sudden somebody says to you, because you are a woman, because you are a Latina, because you are whoever you're, that identity they're placing on you, they're putting different criteria on, on you. And so in my experience, having broken the glass ceiling in so many locations as I've, I've been in my profession, the critical thing is to not be afraid to stand up for rights, but also to ensure that you're bringing other people along with you. Because what I've found is the people that are usually the most um, have the most animus to others will otherwise me and say, oh, but I never thought of you as that minority, Cecilia. And so it's also important that if you are the person that's succeeding in that workplace, that you demonstrate that they can't ignore other racial minorities or other women simply by taking you out of the category of being into something that they disagree with. And if you can have that kind of a conversation with your colleagues in the workplace and explain to them some of what you feel as isolating or what we call today the microaggressions, then you can really start to transform a workplace. And then most importantly, if you are obtaining larger levels of success, my biggest responsibility in my career has always been to ensure that I'm replacing myself with at least two people who look like me, that it's my job not to be I might be the first, but I'm not going to be the last, and I'm not going to hopefully leave someone in the same position I was, which is being alone. Wonderful. Um, all right, so speaking, you both kind of raised the, the K through 12 education, and so we had some um, questions about that. Um, one person asked, how much flexibility do teachers have with the curriculum in Utah? I don't know if any of you, if either of you have experience with that, but if you happen to know what the flexibility is, that would be appreciated. So I, I wouldn't, you know, let me say this to that. Um, and there is um, this whole notion of banning critical race theory within K-12 or uh, within college education. And you've seen many states introduce legislation to do so. Um, and it's really quite foolish. For one, uh, once we start to trample on academic freedom, uh, we can look historically what that has meant in terms of the dumbing down of populations. Uh, we can see what's happening in China now. Uh, and actually, it was China following news in the United States about uh, the COVID vaccine and seeing that our leader was saying that it was a hoax. Uh, and many of their people felt the same way. So as folks who are supposed to be the leaders of the world, we have an obligation, a moral obligation. But my point is this. I could explain what's going on in America in terms of race relations, in terms of structural inequalities and oppression and the deprivation of women and racial and ethnic groups and never use critical race theory. And so um, in the, a teacher, while it may not be in the curriculum, what examples do you use? What heroes and sheroes do you put forward to the students? What study do you have them engage in? So in other words, if it's not formally in the curriculum, but that's a challenge. I do remember my own son when he came home in the seventh grade, I'll never forget. And he said, dad, this history book is not saying the same thing that you've been telling me. And I said, what is that? And his book indeed said that slavery was good for some people and helped out many African-Americans. 
Well, it's one thing to go up to the school at the time. It was another thing as a parent to have the responsibility to outline the culture and history of our people to my son. And I pledged at that time, he was the firstborn, that I had to make sure I did that with all of my children. And so while we talk about critical race theory, harming certain groups, look at our normative socialization process now in terms of what it does to people, in terms of the deprivation that the former speaker talked about that she experienced in K-12 education. So we cannot take for that for granted because as has been said, we other people at that point. I'll stop right there. And I would say I look briefly in preparation for an answer to this question at the st current state board of education standards. And at this point, they have not, they embrace broad tenets that would not preclude any kind of theory specifically. And I do agree with the Dean that the, the horse has been out of the barn, I guess is what, what we would have said already. You're, we're, we're, we're in a place in this country today where the reality of race and racism exists and students, just as they are pushing us on climate change, will push us on how to be better in terms of our race relations. And so I would hope that any legislation that would be proposed in Utah would recognize both academic freedom and the ability of people to have a full history, just as we started with the land acknowledgement today, which in, in prior years would not have been allowed. We, we need to understand the context of where we are and what we are doing in this country in order to be able to be the leaders that the Dean is talking about in the world. And so I would hope that whatever legislation might come forward would recognize that that's important part of, especially as our demographics grow, the majority of this country. Great. Uh, we received a question from the live stream that says, how do you use critical race theory to educate people on the negative aspects of assimilation and embrace respect for multiculturalism? Well, I, I would start by saying the critical race theorists would challenge whether there's a negative aspect to assimilation at the outset, because part of it is there is a dichotomy within the critical race theory movement of how to use rights and how to use the history of where we're at. So assimilation in my own, again, going back to my own situation, allowed me to be the leader that I was, but at a cost that was too high in some respects. I mean, I was deprived of the opportunity to learn Spanish at home because I was in the generation having had my parents be uh, punished for speaking Spanish in school that I could not learn Spanish from my parents. So I had to take Spanish in high school and, and, and later in my life to recapture part of my cultural identity. My son's generation, we put him in an immersion bilingual school and he is bilingual and recaptured that part of his identity and culture. So some of it is assimilation has served purposes over time and crit race theorists would, would evaluate what are the costs and benefits of the assimilation in determining whether assimilation per se is appropriate. So I, I would say at the end of the day, if the loss is such a huge one as cultural identity, that they would say no, that it should not be done. But there are some circumstances where being able to assimilate allows for furthering of the objectives of a critical race theorist rather than diminishing it. And I couldn't agree more. I think that you know when the uh, notion of assimilation came up in the 50s and 60s, uh, we really don't assimilate. We talked about a pluralistic society uh, that gave equal billing to many cultures. And what we have had is basically minority groups assimilating into a rather Eurocentric ideal of how the world is ran. And we're seeing problems with that now, uh, particularly in terms of identity formation, uh, just as Cecilia talked about, I couldn't have said it better. And, and that's a real challenge that each group um, has its own um, special and unique story to tell about how it came into being and its contributions to the forward flow of humanity. And without letting people know who they are within the context that reared them, we robbed them of that. And that's part of the dialogue of critical race theory. I was nodding vigorously when Cecilia was talking because your experience is very similar to my own. My, my grandfather's generation language was deliberately taken from them. I'm a citizen of a, of a tribe. 
And so my mother did not learn our native language. And now my generation is kind of desperately trying to recapture that language um, and teaching it to our children. So uh, very similar experience, which is why I was nodding vigorously. Um, next, we had a question that says, how do we productively talk to people who oppose critical race theory? How do we make sense of news uh, showing people of color advocating to get rid of critical race theory? How do we make sense of the argument that critical race theory ke keeps racism on life support? Apparently a black Colorado father said this at a school board meeting. Well, a critical race theory is not hard. I, I would challenge anyone that says critical race theory is dividing us. I think it is some of the statements that are made by people posing as our leaders that divide us, uh, as well as stroking the fire uh, between racial and ethnic groups that causes us a problem. Uh, I don't see uh, critical race theory doing anything about the distribution of wealth in this country. I don't see it robbing people of food or jobs. So that's just FOI. Uh, I would challenge people to give us concrete examples of that because it's throwaway language. I'll just stop right there. I, I agree. I think um, that was the point I started with in terms of it's not critical of race theory. It is critical race theory, which is used to bring in these different perspectives to whatever discussion is being had. And so the start is always to say, well, what do you mean by critical race theory? And I think once you can engage someone with their lack of knowledge, then that's always a good place to start because you can educate people as to the background and what the theory really is, as opposed to the pre 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 presuppositions. I found it interesting that one of the prevalent uh, criticisms right now of the conservatives against crit theory is that it dismantles liberalism. Well, I think it's pretty funny because, you know, you would think that conservatives wouldn't be embracing liberalism because it sort of sounds endemically counter to the conservative position, right? Because you're a conservative, you shouldn't be embracing liberalism. But it's, again, a lack of understanding of what liberalism, the, 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 what the liberal, liberal movement was about of the, of the civil rights movement and actually started in the 1920s. So again, just looking at what the definitions are and helping people to understand that. And that's where Richard's primer, I think, is pretty good because it does tell you and especially if you go even just to the glossaries, I'm one of those nerds that likes to go back and read the definitions. And I think it gives you then the language, even if you don't read all the other stuff, to be able to move the discussion forward with individuals about what critical race theory is and what it is not. And so that would be what I would encourage people to do. I think we saw that here in Utah, too, in our own recent legislation that was um, uh, suggested the bill spoke to critical race theory, but then in the definition defined it as teaching that one race is inherently superior or inferior to another, which as you have explained is, is not what critical race theory is. So there's the, your point on definitions is well taken, that there seems to be a disjuncture between um, what critical race is and its theory is and its definition and then how it's being defined in, in other contexts. Because um, I think everybody on this call would probably agree that we don't, in our educational institutions, teach that one race is inherently superior or inferior to another. Um, we received a, uh, another question from online, and this one was specifically for Cecilia. It says, what is the state of critical race theory application in the Utah bar? And does the lack of state mandated Spanish, both in civil and criminal manners, diminish due process? Um, I, I don't know what the state of the bar is right now because I'm only, I'm actually inactive in Utah, I will say. I'm active in Colorado, so I, I don't actually know. I'm not up to speed on all of the state rules. I did at one point chair the Continuing Legal Education Committee for the state bar and it was very active at one point in its uh, ed education policies. But I would say in, in terms of the larger question of Spanish mandate for um, for different situations. I, I in, When I was a prosecutor in Salt Lake, translation was mandated. And um, and I think that that's important to, and in, and in the federal government and immigration courts um, under Title VI, there's a larger legal framework, which mandates if there's a certain level of population within a community that things must be produced in the native language of that population in that community. So I think there's that larger legal tool that a crit would say, look at the legal tools that will help you as well, that could be used to advance um, the need for the state to come into compliance with the federal standards with regard to civil rights 
uh, obligations. So that's sort of how, as a crit, I would look at it is what are the tools that are available from the outside that I could use to push for this, this uh, situation? Because I do think to the larger question of due process, an inability to understand what's going on in the process creates a process without a fairness. And, and as I read in, the, in my statement, this is one of the biggest problems of, that crits have with rights language in and of themselves. It's not about, right means that you get the process. It doesn't mean that you get the justice. And so what's important is to look at the larger issue of what is missing in the context of a criminal case or another case where an individual doesn't have access to the language that they speak. Because if they don't know what's going on, and we would see this all the time in immigration cases, then how can they be meaningful participants in a system that purportedly provides justice? They can't. So we, we need to remedy and identify the underlying problems with the, the issue. And that's the way a critical theorist would look at the problem. It's in the past, it would be solved by just like, oh, we have a procedure and that's fair because we provide due process. But if due process forecloses the ability to actual, accurately be part of that process, then it isn't the process at all. I know that's been a big movement in Indian country too, especially a lot of communities where um, indigenous people speak their indigenous language to make sure that things are translated and you have access. Um, we got a short question that just asked, is critical race theory now a required part of the law school curriculum? I can answer that one quickly. It is not. Um, I'm not aware of any law school in the country that requires critical race theory. Um, many law schools teach it, but I'm not aware of anybody who requires it. Um, so the next question is, how can we teach critical race theory to police academies to help combat police brutality? Is this even possible? That's a, a huge question. I, it would take a lot of training, um, quite a bit, and uh, would take a lot of self-training. Um, look, uh, I'm a veteran of the United States Army. Before I went to war in Iraq, I read two books about Iraq. I read books about Afghanistan. I read history of Latinos in our country. I read books on the history of Asian Americans in our country. And so we need to really understand what's going on. And so it's up to individuals, but we have to show them the worth of doing that, of doing so. And our leaders who stroke fire uh, and use race as a wedge issue, do not do us any favors. And so uh, that's a huge issue that needs to take place, but that has to do with the leadership within police academies. And I think that actually is an uphill climb that we have within our society, uh, which is another topic. And I would say it's not the theory itself that's important in terms of those situations. Again, at the beginning of my career, I was a prosecutor. And really what's more important is teaching community policing so that you are teaching the law enforcement officers about the communities that they're serving in order to diminish adverse perceptions they might have with regard to how to police those individuals. And what the, the police programs that have been the most successful across the country in de-escalating uh, conflict between police departments in the community are those that put the police officers back on the streets to actually be in community with the community. And those programs that emerged after 9-11, which militarized the police departments is where critical race theorists are now focusing their legal analysis and that's because we see that that is a structural um, tool being used to create further oppression within those communities. By distancing yourself from the community, you change the dynamic of policing. And so I would say as a, as a crit theorist that what I would wanna do is increase community policing and community education in part because that also deescalates the tension of, oh, it's, I'm just, they're just focusing on what is my pronoun? They're just focusing on whatever people want to dismiss in terms of a theory or diversity training. And you're instead focusing on how can I be more effective in my job? And I can do that if I understand the community. And if I'm not afraid of the community and the community is not afraid of me, I think then police officers across this country would be better served and so would the communities that they serve. And that's why you also see the dichotomy in the African-American community of feeling like in many of their neighborhoods, they are under-policed and they would like more police presence. 
as opposed to the act black activists who are on the streets fighting against the abuses of police. So people say, how can you have those, those inconsistent positions? And I think that speaks to one of the earlier questions as well. And the reason is, is because there are different solutions within the system that need to be addressed. And we have to be open to all of those solutions and understanding the needs for ensuring that black communities are safe. And I, let me add to that well stated uh, that uh, when we talk about community policing, the undergirth of that is to get rid of myths about people so that uh, black folks are lazy, uh, criminalized. And so that, that meant stop and frisk up in New York was disproportionately stopped and frisked amongst black folk as well as driving while black. And the same thing happened to our Latinx community. Mm -hmm. So those presuppositions have to go as a part of uh, community-based training for police officers. And that is a, is a huge, because that's what we get in our K through 12 education. So that when we see these desperate numbers of disproportionality and negative indicators, we go that, well, that's kind of what those people do. So true. I think we could spend a lot of time talking about that and the, the school to prison pipeline. And yeah. um, there's been a lot of success in the news lately or stories of success in the news lately of um, police departments that are hiring social workers and having in nonviolent situations, um, having the social workers as first responders and having success there. So I think this is maybe this is the topic for our next um, race and racism discussion. But in terms of I think we have time for one last question. And somebody asked. Uh, where do you think this this uh, discussion and debate around critical race theory is headed? Um, I see it right now as being a major wedge issue for the 2022 elections, frankly. Uh, we see that in local communities with activists being um, engaged at the school board levels. And I think that it could have an adverse impact on our educational system unless people are educated to understand that it's not meant to be harmful. It is not meant to be harmful, but it is rather a, 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 that what we are trying to do is broaden the educational opportunities for all students to maybe eventually to, to now finally start to eliminate the discrimination that was noted in Brown versus Board of Education. I mean, we've seen that it's gone backwards. The retrenchment that I talked about has happened in education in terms of the resegregation of our schools. And they, that's been done by, uh, when I lived in San Antonio, there were 12, I think, independent school districts because each school district could be smaller and smaller in order to avoid then integration within the boundaries. And you then ended up ultimately with segregated schools because the smaller, you know, the white, population would create a school district around their own community and leaving the African-American or Latino community to have to uh, struggle in some other school district. So there are mechanisms uh, of, of that that will happen. And I do think where we're at right now is on, on the challenge with our younger people being able to push progressive issues, hopefully to also be politically engaged to preclude the, the statements. I mean, but but I, I think about this last year with the the things you would see on the news in terms of the animus of at local and city school board school board meetings or city council meetings. Um, and really the challenge for us today is to become more politically active in my view, in order to say that loud voice isn't the only voice and that the majority of this country holds the principles of equality of opportunity and equality of result, not just a procedural process that doesn't result in, in any kind of success. And I wholeheartedly agree with Cecilia. I think this is a wedge issue and our political leaders have a bigger platform and they continue to this, in these binary discussions of, you know, I'm better than you or this person's infringing upon my rights for X, Y, and Z. Uh, basically gets us nowhere in the long run. But the hope is young people, as Cecilia is saying, they're pushing uh, the demographic change within our country, despite the recent issues on abortion, will not change the growing minority majority and the need to make change within our society. I'm afraid we're headed in the wrong place because all of this really ties together. The lie for January 6th, the hoax about a pandemic, uh, the strife based on critical race theory and a number of things 
lead us to more authoritarianism and making groups mm-hmm. feel as if they're that if they sign on with people who espouse their beliefs uh, to stay in power and to keep their wealth, that somehow that's going to make all of us better. That's racialized thinking is extremely problematic. Let me go back to one sample example that Cecilia mentioned. Nobody wants an armored personnel carrier in their community. It was a shame to see an APC in Michigan in Ferguson when the people were unarmed, but because it was blacks, racialized thinking meant that that was okay. That is not something okay for any of our communities. There is an entrenchment upon our rights and we need to fight back. And the hope is young people. And so um, I'll just stop right there. Well, I think that's a great place to stop. I know that my my students are always teaching me new things um, and uh, calling me on my mistakes. So I am very uh, hopeful for our uh, younger generations, which certainly doesn't mean that our generation doesn't have work to do as well. So I just wanna thank our amazing panelists. That was a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the Alumni Association for hosting this conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of months to continue our discussion of race and racism. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks.